the uh, end of the day, which should work. We wouldn't have done something else, okay? Okay, now we have the agenda. Um, so first, I will say some few words about what is CDI and what is EJD. Um, then I will give you an introduction about what, what is basically a container. Because they are both containers, so we should know what, what, what we are talking about there. Then, uh, when we are talking about containers, it's important uh, to know because they are providing instances. And that's the reason it's important that we know how to use these in instances, what is the life cycle, and uh, in which context these instances are used. So that will be then the, the third point of our of talk. Uh, after that, we basically know about CDI, about the basics of CDI and GB, that's the idea. And then we will dive a little bit deeper into the advanced features of both technologies. And uh, then we will come to a conclusion about the differences and I will say something about further reading so you can get more information. Uh, yeah, so basically start with the, with the overview of CDI and EJB. Um, if you want to compare them, because I just mentioned they are both uh, container technologies, uh, we basically need to know what the, what the container is. Um, but both basically provide component technology, uh, provide they are both component technologies that provide uh, a container for instances of Java classes, also known as Beans. And uh, if we take a look at the Enterprise Java Beans, they are there for now a long time. They are part of the Java Enterprise Edition uh, since, since the first version, basically. And um, actually, they are in the version two in the Java Enterprise Edition 7. And then on the other hand we have uh, context and dependency injection, CDI, which just recently came to the Java Enterprise uh, in, uh, Edition in version 6 it was introduced uh, as part of the standard and it's right now the actual version is 1.2 of CDI. Yeah, and uh, as said before they're both are container technologies, so we want to take a look at what, what is a container actually. Uh, so we're coming to the next point. What we're not talking about is like Docker. You probably heard that a lot of times, Docker also container. But that's not, not the idea what we're talking about. We're talking about some piece of software that is basically creating and controlling instances of Java classes and providing these instances for usage in our, our components, right? So that's something totally different. If you later after the talk think, oh, that guy was talking about Docker, then it's like uh, the, the wrong thing, right? Um, so let's first, uh, so it's about controlling instances. First we take a look at what is the traditional approach to control instances. Um, let's say we have a class, and in our class we basically will uh, create like an uh, instance of another class that might be dependent on another class and on another class. So we'll have like this this nice tree of of instances um, that we have to control from our from our class. So the disadvantages of this naive or traditional approach is basically that our class has to control the life cycle of these instances and has to provide like factories uh, to create them and uh, take care of also of the dis destroying of, of these instances. And it also has to keep all these de uh, dependencies that we are having here of these, uh, of these classes, at least the diagrams, right? So this, this basically leads to a lot of so-called plumbing codes. Huh? We have to put that all these, these factory methods and all these connection of these components, we have to put that all together in our, our class and have to take care of that. That's one disadvantage that we have to write there a lot of plumbing code. The other one is also 
that these dependencies that we are having here are usually, um, if, we, if we want to write a unit test, we have to uh, mock them. And that's not easily mocked because they are basically graded in their class. So that make, makes writing unit tests a little bit more difficult. So now in contrast, then we have uh, the, um, the uh, if, if we're using a container, huh? we're using a container, our class is not taking care of the life cycle of, the, of these instances. It's basically done by this container. So as you see, we now have the container set of our class. So the question is, how does our class then get can use these instances. This is done by this so-called dependency injection. So basically, container is uh, grading these instances and inject these instances basically in that class that is using it. So as you can see now, what are the advantages? Basically, we don't, we don't have the dependencies to all these these classes that we before had to grade. We just have the dependency that. Uh, that we are having here. So basically we have uh, less dependencies in, in our class that we are writing. We also don't need to control the life cycle of these dependencies, uh, which, as we said, uh, leads to a lot of plumbing code. And the container can also easily take care of that you can share these instances with maybe another class. Right? So the idea that basically is behind that is that we have um, so we're basically using the right instance at the right time. That's basically the main idea about that. So, um, yeah, then this leads to a couple of questions if we now have a container. Uh, one, one is, for example, how can I actually use this instance? How they are coming magically from into my class? So, because I said the container is grading them. What is also the life cycle of these instances that I'm creating? And when are we using which instance? That's basically the three, the three main questions that we're having. And now in the following part of the talk, we will basically analyze these three questions for each of these technologies, to use for CDI and PTV, to see what, what, what are basically the differences. Um, yeah, so that, that brings us to our next chapter, which is basically the usage and the life cycle in the context. First, we come to the usage example, which answers the first question, how we, how we use these instances. It's, it's, it's actually pretty simple. Um, we, we have a very simple example of where we have an instance variable, like in a class. Uh, the class is uh, the... the Last time of the instance that we that we want to use is my bean, and the uh, instance variable name is uh, bean instance. We just have to add this inject annotation, and then magically the container injects us an instance of the class. We don't know yet what instance. We're talking about it later, but we, we have an instance of the class. So that's how we use that. And later on in the code, we could just uh, call a method on that instance. So this is like injecting with uh, instance variable. There's also constructor or, or, or method injection, but just to get an idea uh, how that is done. And what we will see is that basically they are the same for CDI and NJB. So no difference yet. So then we can take a look at the life cycle. Here's a nice diagram. I actually stole it from the Java Enterprise tutorial from Oracle. Um, basically, how, how are these uh, instances of our beans created? In this case, the example for CDI bean. So basically, they have a constructor. The, con the, the container is calling the constructor. And we have basically an instance of the bean. Then the container is doing the so-called dependency injection, injects all the necessary dependencies that we have. And then uh, uh, an optional method with the so-called post-construct annotation is called. Uh, the difference here compared to a constructor, we have a constructor. Uh, if we do something in, 
we use any of the injected dependencies in the constructor, we basically get a null point exception because it hasn't been injected yet. Uh, as you see, first we call the dependency injection, and then uh, we call the post construct uh, method. After that, basically our bean is ready for usage, right? So that's why we're in the ready state. Uh, we're going from this does not exist state to the ready state. Um, later on, before the container, he's also destroying the instance, right? Before the container, the container will destroy the instance. Uh, he's notifying our bean with a, uh, with a callback, with an optional callback that he's about to destroy it, um, which is basically a useful method for deallocating any resources that we're using. Um, to use this method, you basically have to write up in any method in bean and annotate it with this pre-destroy annotation. <coughs> so that is the life cycle for, for CDI bean. And so now we, we take a look at the life cycle asset for HIV bean, and surprisingly, it's not all the same. And they, they changed it. Uh, so the life cycle from HIV bean they did, did evolve a little bit in the, in the different uh, Java E versions. But now we basically have they have aligned it to the CI life cycle. So you can also use this post construct annotations, restore callbacks all this stuff. So basically we have all the, also the same life cycle. It's all the same. So right now it's all the same. So what's actually the difference? Um, which brings us to our third question. When are we actually using which instance? And we first want to answer that now for CDI. So you might guess there might be now coming up a difference. Uh, for CDI, the answer depends on the, on the context object. A context object in the in the application, we have a couple of uh, context objects. For example, it's um, it's a HTTP request or a user session. These are basically context objects, and we could uh, basically bind the uh, the lifetime of our being to to the lifetime of the context object. So as long as the context object exists, the instance of our bean is existing. This is all a little bit theoretic now, but we come, we'll come uh, soon to a couple of examples that explain that that's a little bit better. Um, these, these instances that we are creating are sets that depend on, on the existence of the context object. And this, um, uh, we usually say that uh, depending on which type of context object they are depending on, uh, we basically say they are of this scope or that scope. So for example, if they depend on a request, on an HTTP request, we say they are request scope means. Um, so important here to notice is that with the existence of the with the existence of the context object, these instances are created and they are destroyed. That's that's basically a really important thing to, to remember here. So we come to the next point where we show that a little bit in a, in a sequence diagram uh, where we have like. We're calling now a bean from one context, uh, context one, and we have this bean. And as long as we are basically in the same uh, context, we're always getting the same bean instance. If we do a call, uh, call on that on that bean. Uh, so as you can see, we do call the method to do something. The second time we call the, call the method to do something we're still in the same bean instance, bean instance one. Now compare it if we call from a different context, so we have now two different context, context, uh, context we're calling from, context one and context two. And context one is calling do something on, on our bean and then we are getting instance from bean one. Context two is making another call, we're getting another instance of our being. 
But that's like the basics, how that basically works. We will now see for, uh, for different scopes how that works. Of course, we will see what, what, what different typical context objects exist in an application. Um, so on the x-axis, we basically have the object, the lifetime of the object, right? And um, one very typical context object that we have is the HTTP request. Uh, we usually somehow have found as a context or uh, HTTP request in the call of our application. The user does a, a HTTP request and then uh, in, the, in the environment that our being exists, we have, it belongs to exactly one HTTP request. So HTTP request is a context object. And another context object is the user view. View is basically concerning the, the model view controller uh, pattern. Is uh, is like one one view where the user is doing something that usually exists longer the user view than a HTTP request because the user could do a multiple request on just one view, right? And then even longer we have a user session. The user session could exist for for hours maybe. And most likely the user was already um, was already uh, clicking on different views, right? And then finally the longest lifetime is then the whole lifetime of our whole application. Um, and now for all these context objects we could have uh, different beings with different scope. So for the request we would have the request scope, for the user session we would have the session scope, and for the application we would have the application scope beans. And then we take a look at that. Uh, now we have a, such a request scope bean in CDI, and we have uh, we, we're calling a method of a bean in, in the context of this request. And uh, we do it two times from the same, from the same uh, request and we see we're getting always the same bean instance because we're calling from the same context. The context is for a request scope bean, the request. That's, that's the important thing. Now we're having different requests. We have two different requests, therefore we have two different contexts if we are talking about a request for being. And uh, so we have request one, it's doing a call on the bean, and then we're getting bean instance one. We have request two, another request, and we're doing a call on the request for being, and we're getting a new instance. If we would do from the same context to another call, we would, we would get the same instance again because we're still in the same context. Um, now we are taking a look at if the context object is not a request but it's a user session. That's also could easily be done because you have your web application and you always have in your code that you're running a user session as long as the user, uh, even if it's not uh, authorized. Okay, so we, we have now in the context, oh, there's actually an error, but so that should be like, no, no it's not, the, not an error. So basically, we have requests now, we take a look at requests from the same user. So we all in the same user, a user could have a couple of requests, but they're all from the same user session and we have a session scope B. So now we are uh, in request one, we're doing a call on the session scope B. We're getting uh, B instance one, and then we have another request, but it's from the same user, so he's getting the same instance. It's getting the same instance because it's session scope. Before it was request scope, then he would get a new instance, but now it's session scope. So in that session scope B, we would could store data that we want to keep for the whole user session. Um, and now we basically have um, two different contexts 
because we have two different user sessions and we have to we, we have a mean of session scope. If user one is calling a method on the bin, he's getting a new instance. If, uh, and he can then do something in, in the context of the user, we can do something with that, with that instance. If another user, uh, if we call from another user session, our beam, our session scope beam, we're getting another instance, especially only if usable for this user, and he can uh, store his own data. So that's, that's important. Session scope, we could store data that we use for the user session. Request scope, we store data that, we, uh, that just exists for the lifetime of the request. And now we come to the third scope. So for the third CDI scope, it's called the application scope. Now we see there are a couple of different users calling uh, this uh, this um, this beam, and they're all getting the same instance because that's the reason we basically say it's a singleton. A singleton it exists once in the in the virtual machine, and they all all these user sessions calls get the get the same instance. So now the good thing is we, we've seen now a couple of um, seen now a couple of scopes. And the good thing is you can even create your own UCI. If you have a contextual object, you write your your context object, uh, and then you can create your own uh, scopes that you can reuse. Uh, Java server faces. Uh, I'm not sure everyone knows that Java server face is basically the, the user interface standard for Java Enterprise Edition. It's not so popular because it stores a lot of state on the server side. But just as an example, they provide their own scopes. For example, the view scope. We had before, maybe you remember it in the context objects diagram, the, the user view as a context object. So this view scope is using this user view from Java server faces which is of course a Java server faces object, uh, uses this context object to provide this view scope. So if I store data in that scope, uh, in beans with that scope, they basically only exist for the lifetime of the Java server faces view. I can store there, for example, like validation data. Uh, that's what they're useful for. Um, so now the question is, we were covering now the question, when are we using which instance for CDI? And now we want to do that for EJD. It's a little bit different. Um, EJDs are, per definition, uh, not contextual. They're not contextual beings. They don't depend on any of these concepts that we had before with the context. They actually depend, if they depend, they depend on the calling object. Um, and they are, the calling object is basically I, I, the one I call the method from uh, in our sequence diagram. And there are uh, three different types of EJBs. It's uh, singleton, stateless, and stateful. We will now cover how that looks like in our context diagrams for these three different types. Um, no, we're not covering here message-driven beams, for those of you who know them. They are basically stateless from our, uh, for our concern. Um, so we have the singleton, which is the easiest one. You see it's pretty similar to the application scope that we had before, because it's a singleton, we only break one for the, for the virtual machine. Uh, so we have the caller is doing something, we have another caller on that object. We always get the same instance. Pretty simple. And now we have a so-called stateless uh, enter enterprise Java Bean, EJB, uh, where we have now a couple of callers. We have two callers and we're doing a couple of method calls. And what we see here, we're not sure which instance we're getting. 
one time we might get this instance, one time we might get that instance. So what does that mean actually? It means that we cannot store any data in these instances because we never know what instance we are getting. And that's the reason they are called stateless. You're not supposed to store any state there. Um, usually implementations of application services, they actually pool these instances. Um, but that's not required by specification. Uh, that was in the time when the VM was a little bit slower in creating instance. Basically, we have their instance pool. But as you can see, important to remember is we don't know which instance we're getting. One time we're getting stateless one, one time we're getting stateless two, or maybe ten, if we have an instance pool of ten, right? That's, that's how that basically is. You cannot do any assumptions on the instance we're getting. Now we have the, but there also exists something like uh, stateful, just for completion, we have it here, it's not used that much anymore. Um, as I said, the interviews are not contextual, but they may be as well stateful, so you can store state there. Um, if you uh, have a reference to one of these stateful uh, component instances, basically the color of, of the object is getting from the EJB implementation a reference to that EJB. And then um, you can pass that reference to another caller, uh, but you have to do that manually. And then the other caller can reuse it. And you can, uh, must also explicitly destroy them. There's a remove uh, annotated method that you have to call, and then basically the, the EJB implementation will mark the beam for getting destroyed. So how does it look like in our sequence diagram? We basically have the caller one, which by doing the call to do something, it's creating a new instance of our stateful beam. Oh, that's the first step. Then we basically give that reference to another caller. He can also do call to do something or do whatever with with uh, with the same method, and then later on the the caller is re removing it, which which uh, tells the or tells the, the container basically to destroy the beam to be more precise. So now we covered basically all these different types of CDI and EJB, and now the question is uh, maybe it isn't a question, maybe you're totally confused right now, but uh, the the question is. Why, why are people so confused with, with, the, with the two, two things? Um, so, so I think because they are very similar, the whole thing, that's, that's pretty confusing. And they added it late, uh, later, uh, CDI, to the, to the specification, but EJB still exists. And there are a lot of similarities which, which cause this confusion. So, so for example, CDI application scope and EJB singleton they are basically the same, right? From the from the scope point of view, they, they are a single thing, as we just learned. Then we have like CDI request scope and HIV, HIV stateless. They actually can be the same. Huh? What conditions can they be the same from the scope point of view? Because we, we learned that, of course, a HTTP request has a very short lifetime, and then most likely you won't, uh, you can, as long as you don't store any state, any request specific state in the, in the uh, request scope beam, they can behave as a, as a HIV stateless beam. So you could have the same application, you have a HIV stateless beam, and you change the annotation, it's just an annotation, to request scope, then you have a CDI beam, application behaves the same way. Of course, that's a little bit confusing, although it's something completely different. Even more confusing, according to the specification, um, EJB is, uh, is also actually a CDI beam that's, uh, that came as part of the, with the Java E6, that EJB also must be a uh, uh, CDI beam. Some people even say that EJB actually is, it contains CDI for that reason, so EJB equals greater CDI. Sometimes this is useful, is because basically the, the two standards they are getting more and more aligned, 
Uh, sometimes it's useful. We saw that at the beginning as I was using inject, inject annotation to inject um, a CDI bean and an EJB bean. That's possible because the EJB is also a CDI bean. In the past, there was a special EJB, uh, still exists a special EJB annotation to inject an EJB. So sometimes this is very useful. Sometimes this is even more confusing. You could even like uh, have a stateful EJB and add a CDI context uh, scope to it, right? So that's what you can do. Um, which you're basically mixing the two technologies, and then it's very hard to predict what, what's actually happening. And if you want to do that, you can have a lot of discussions about that on Stack Overflow. Um, but generally, I think that's not very helpful because uh, code should be not that you have to look up somewhere where, where what it was it actually doing. You should know by reading the code what it is doing. Right? So it's it's not from my point of view. It's not a good idea to to, to mix these two technologies so to reduce confusion. You should definitely separate the usage of CDI and technique. And that's why I also prefer to see them as different technologies. Um, so now we go into further features. We have uh, passivation. Passivation is basically uh, if you have a bean that has a long lifetime, then for uh, for for economic reasons, you don't want to keep it in the server memory all the time. That's the reason the server, the container, can decide to passivate the bean, which basically means he puts it on a, on a secondary storage, for example, your hard drive. Uh, that means basically your bean instance is serialized, stored on the, hard, uh, on the file system, and then like if it's used again, it's deserialized. Because it's user session object might be open for a couple of hours, but the user is going to the toilet or not coming back, and then it's using too many server resources, right? So this is for long living scopes to save server memory. A bean is doing that, must implement the serializable interface so the container could serialize and deserialize bean. We actually have that for CDI and EJB. Depends on the scope for EJB. It's not so stateful. Doesn't doesn't make any sense passive way being having a stateful beam because they don't have any state. A uh, stateless beam because they don't have any state. But stateful beam, uh, that's where it was actually introduced. But CDI also has it. CDI session scope beams would be passive way. Uh, now we're taking a look at what actually different. Uh, what only has. Uh, what only the CDI, CDI has. Um, in CDI, the beans that could send and receive synchronous events, which is very good to further decouple uh, your, your application. Uh, you have less dependencies because you don't have a direct dependencies uh, to uh, the information you're receiving. You just have, uh, you basically uh, receive an event from, from, a, from a third party and you can yourself decide how you, how you work on that. These are all uh, virtual machine internal events and they are global events. Huh? You can use them for like domain specific events like new customer added, new customer or, or existing customer updated. That's like a useful use case for, for these events. But you, of course you should not overuse them because they basically cause side effects. Because they are, they are global, if you receive an event, there could, uh, could weird, weird things could happen. Um, you have to also be careful, don't mix it up with the message driven beans from EJB. Um, that's, that's something uh, completely different. Uh, they are basically stateless beans that receive uh, a song, a song uh, a synchronously. Sorry about that, about my poor English. <laughs> Uh, receive Java uh, messaging service messages. So this is not something virtual machine internal, that's about receiving messages from a message queue. Uh, CDI also has these so-called producers. They are basically factory methods 
to create means from arbitrary classes. Uh, here's like an example. Let's say we are needing um, we are needing a locker. Locker is something we use a lot in our application, and uh, we just want to inject the locker and then be able to use the locker. So we provide like a factory method for that locker and the locker object is then after that a CDI beam. Before it couldn't be we use as a CDI beam because it uh, doesn't have like um, uh, um, it because it has dependencies and in this uh, case like like a string which couldn't be provided by the um, container automatically so you need like a factory method to produce that locker and use it as a CDI beam. And then you can basically use it everywhere in the application. Um, producers only exist in CDI. It doesn't have anything like that. Um, now we have these events on these producers, and you see like a logger, a logger has this. You might want different loggers in your application, maybe one for a domain log, the other one for more for a technical log. And then you don't want to know which one you're using at which time. If you now inject it, you would you have basically two implementations, right? So what, how do you solve that if an injection is uh, ambitious? If we have two implementations, um, with which one should be used, right? We're providing two different loggers, which one should be used? The domain lock or the technical lock? at the injection point. So we can resolve the problem if we, use, uh, if we build an annotation for ourselves and tag basically the wanted implementation. And this time we could use an annotation called domain lock and an annotation called tag lock. And then I just inject the logger with the domain lock and I'm sure I'm getting the domain lock. That's also in CDI only. Um, CDI also allows you to extend your container. Uh, there are a lot of extensions. You find them on uh, the website Apache Delta Spike. That's a project where you could basically extend further your CDI. There's there are more scopes uh, you can find there. You can find transactional support for GPA, uh, for Java Persistence API, and you have like a scheduler from parts where you can invoke uh, beam methods by a timer. You also have uh, declarative security. You just add an annotation and then it could only be called in a different security context. And these are a couple of extensions you have for CDI. And now we're coming to each of the only features. If we take a look at the standard, not about these extensions we have. Uh, right now. Uh, so EJB per standard allows an invocation triggered by the so-called EJB timer. So we have a remote method invocation uh, via RMI. Uh, so you could provide a so-called remote interface for your for EJBs and then do a remote method call, which you can do in CDI out of the box. Same for a synchronous method invocation, so you don't have to wait for, for the call to end, you get a future object. And it also provides declarative security out of the box. You see it's a little bit similar than the, than the slide before, that the extensions that are provided for, for CDI for a good reason, because you want to use CDI usually and then feature you don't have, you, you use an extension. Or you fall back to each of you. Now we, we go to an example about a so-called de declarative security. Let's say we have given a service pattern which has basically we want transactional methods. We have a service class, we want transactional methods. Uh, so each call is basically, each method call is basically a transaction. Uh, and we want to the calls secured by a security context uh, to ensure that not everyone can do that call, right? So only a logged in user, for example, or admin 
that has a different type of role according to this uh, Java authentication standard. And we want the service plan to be stateless so we can easily scale our services. So how does it look with Java E7 just using EJB? That's pretty simple actually to do that. Um, we, we have there our service class. We put in the stateless annotation and it's a stateless EJB. And we do another annotation where we say that we only allow the admin role. And uh, yeah, then, then, then we're basically done. If we compare Java E7 using CDI, then we can add the request scope annotation, and it's a request scope beam, and transactional, then we have transactions, but we are missing the declarative security. And now comes something interesting. Actually, in Java E8, that's due for at least next year, they plan to include now declarative security also in CDI. As you can see, you can also use the annotation. And then you basically have the same functionality as in EJB. You can out of the box implement the wanted service pattern with CDI or EJB the same way. So finally, what are our conclusions? Uh, CDI has definitely a better container design where the producers, the events, the qualifiers, a lot of nice features. Uh, EJB still has more like, like this, these enterprise features, like, like, uh, like these timers that we're talking about, where we now need CDI extensions to, to do them. But with each Java Enterprise Edition release, EJB becomes more obsolete, obsolete because we're getting all these features also in CDI. Anyhow, but if, you're, if your application needs EJB features, like a nice timer, you can use them. There are not that many timers in your application probably. And, but you should have mixed technologies with different layers. Uh, that's something what I definitely would never recommend. Yeah, for the readings, I uh, was in the past writing a book in German about Java Enterprise Edition. That was the first one, first German book about the Enterprise Edition 7. That was pretty popular on Amazon. And then um, the co writer I'm writing it with Martin. We decided to translate them step by step in English. And we enhance them a little bit that we using a cloud ID. So basically you can see these books now uh, online uh, under these URLs you find there. You also see for the CDI book we use a nice one on one tower here. And uh, yeah, you, you don't need any uh, configuration, you just use the, uh, the cloud IDE to do these examples. So that's why we call them usually in a day because we're sure you can finish them in a day, these topics, and then you would know more about CDI or for, about EJB, but we're still doing the translation for the EJB one. So, and that basically brings us to the final part. Uh, the questions and discussions, as you can see, there's also the link for the slides where they are available. So, are there any questions from the side? Yeah, the last one. Because I'm far familiar with the screen, uh -huh. what is the screen that this EJB and CDI is compared to? Is the screen also a container or is it different from other? A screen is also a container, or let's say, like, uh, I'm not. The, for me, it's the opposite. I'm not so familiar with being more familiar with CDI, right? Uh, but uh, I, I also use that word Spring, and the core part of Spring is also a container, as I said it before, and they also have different different scope. They were quite simulton, prototype scope, which is basically creating all the time a new instance, the prototype, similar to to the status EJB or the request scope uh, in, in CDI. Yeah. I have a lot of questions. A lot of questions, okay. <laughs> do, we, do we still have a lot of time? Or, uh, maybe we ask someone else first, or if someone else has a question. Okay, so no one has a question. If I use a, I, I inject some of the information into the class stack, 